um, the graphs of um, inverse trigonometric functions is obviously a type of graph you should know. Um, I'll be doing an example on how to extract the cos inverse or arc cos and then the similar process follows for sine inverse and tan inverse and then I'm going to just wrap it up with uh, all the properties you should know regarding the domain and range. So um, what I have here is the cosine function, so cos of x within 2 pi, so we have this, um, fun uh, this uh, graph, so this is common. Now if I want to do cos inverse or arc cos, so if I, wanna, if I want to go cos of x, and this should be, um, some of these facts should be familiar from if you studied inverse functions. So one thing to know is that if a function, so um, or let's use an if and if statement. If I have this is my function, this is only this has an inverse if and only if um, it's a one to one function. And more um, loosely, we could say that it passes the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. So, previously, if you wanted to make sure that a function is um, as a valid function, um, all you had to do was do a um, a line test to check a vertical line test to check that it only passes one point. But now we want to check not only the vertical line test, we want to check that it has a horizontal line test and um, that will guarantee that it has an inverse. So there are functions that do not have inverses. Now a vertical line test means that if I pass a vertical line anywhere, it only crosses my actual function once. So we know cos would pass this test. But if I go the horizontal test, it will keep on passing two points. So I'll have an issue, but I know that I should be able to use cos inverse, like this is actually a function in the calculator, um, and it's something we would use. So that means we have to restrict the domain of cos inverse, and we can restrict it by restricting the, sorry, we can restrict the domain of cos x, and hence we would able to construct a proper cosine inverse of x. So notice how it always crosses the second point as soon as it crosses this pi point. So it means if I can actually eliminate this whole section, so if I can eliminate anything after pi, I will have a valid um, I will have a valid cosine function that has a valid inverse. So if I just take this from 1 until negative 1 from 0 to pi and do the whole process of finding an inverse function, I can actually find it. So what I have here is a nicely laid out graph, but what I did in the graph is that the x and the y coordinates are in radians. Um, but I know let me graph my cosine function. So my cosine, I've also outlined where 0 and 1 and 1, 0 are. It's just going to be helpful. Um, so what I'm going to do is take my 1 here. I'm just going to graph my cosine. And I know at pi over 2, it's going to be 0. And then at pi, it's going to be negative 1. So that's about um, here. Uh, negative 1, sorry. So if I just do a... What I want to do now, now that I've restricted my domain, what I want to do is find the inverse of this. Now, there's a quick way of finding the inverse, and that's by actually um, reflecting your sketch on a y equals to x uh, line. So if I go and draw a y equals to x, I'm just going to do a very thin line so it goes here. And what you essentially want to do is reflect everything. Um, and you could do that um, roughly, but um, let's start with actually highlighting some coordinates we could use. So I know that it's 0, 1 here. Um, sorry, not 0, 1. It's, yeah, it's 0, 1 here. 
and I know that it's going to cross 0, 1 here as well. So I know that this is going to be a coordinate in my reflected cos inverse. So remember, these are inverses. Um, I also have that as pi over 2, 0 is a coordinate, which means if I flip it over, it's going to be 0 pi over 2. Um, we could you could you could highlight as many points as you want and identify where the function can uh, will reflect um, so this sort of behavior up until here will reflect down here so we have something like this for this section of the line and then this line will reflect above and go and cross here the last point is going to be pi is my pi negative 1 so we're expecting a negative 1 pi so my negative 1 is here so we are expecting a negative 1 pi so all I'm doing is kind of flipping the coordinates so um, I can continue my curve I know it's going to cross the y-axis here and then curve up this way so Um, so this is my cost inverse function and all I'm using is facts that I know about inverse functions so more clearly this is what it would look like so switching the colors the blue is my cost inverse and my green is my cost so we have as you can see it's completely reflected but we had to first restrict the domain or else it won't be a proper function. So in general, this is what you get for inverse trigonometric functions. This has been taken from um, the IB book from um, Hayes and you have inverse trigonometric functions. So if I look at the cos that we have here, y equals to arc cos, um, the definition is basically x is equal to cos of y so that, this is just extra information but the, do, the the domain is negative one to one as you can see it goes from a negative one this was our negative one and this is our one so this blue line is only defined from negative one to one and the range goes from zero to pi so we have it starts from zero and it goes up until pi and it's very different for each of the other trigonometric functions and it's all because of how um, you restrict the domain initially. So you can easily try the same exercise with sine and the same thing with tan.